Hello everyone. Good afternoon, parents. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's session um, conducted by Emirati Primary School. I'm the principal, Mr. Pick, uh, and this session is um, about our sharing uh, with um, preschool parents about um, our own um, maybe personal insights on how parents should uh, choose the primary school for your children. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, let me um, thank all our preschool uh, partners, uh, which my um, vice principal, Mrs. Uh, Joyce Lim, has been uh, engaging and contacting. And uh, we are very happy uh, to have their support and uh, discussion on the kind of uh, materials that we should be including in our sessions and for sharing uh, information about these sessions with all the parents. So thank you very much, preschools. Let me uh, move on to the next part. Okay, so this session will be recorded and uh, it will be uploaded on our school's uh, YouTube site. Uh, so how to find our school YouTube site? Um, you just uh, go into YouTube and you type in our school name, Emirati Primary School. Uh, you'll be able to find uh, our um, school's uh, YouTube site and uh, the video will be uploaded uh, there. We can upload it in our... Um, school website because uh, we have a limited capacity in our school website. Um, but the PowerPoint slides will be uploaded onto our school website. So if all that you need to uh, see or review is the um, materials on the PowerPoint slides, then you can uh, go to our school website uh, after this session uh, to take a look and review the information from the slides. Um, this is uh, not a webinar session, so this is a normal Zoom session. Uh, so, uh, if you have any questions as the uh, presentation is ongoing, uh, we welcome you to type in your questions in the, using the chat function uh, and my team will try to answer them uh, as we move along uh, with, the, uh, with the presentation uh, and questions that we are not able to uh, answer uh, by typing in, we will address uh, them at the end of the session. All right, so um, we, this session is very much uh, trying to address the following questions. Uh, so why choosing the right primary school matters? Um, what are the factors that parents should consider when choosing a school for your child? Um, and many of you probably are uh, first time parents uh, and therefore you, are, you might have been very confused uh, listening to all your friends talking about the different phases of uh, primary school registration. So in this session here, we are also going to uh, spend a bit of time uh, talking about uh, the different phases and also uh, highlighting some of the recent changes that was announced um, last year uh, and will be implemented in this year's primary one, uh, primary one registration. Um, of course, the last question that we will address would also be about what parents can do to help your child transit uh, from preschool to primary school. So we want to uh, emphasize that this session is not about uh, why you should choose Emirati Primary School. This is not a session to promote our school. Uh, we very much uh, approach this session from a very uh, neutral position uh, on what parents should be considering uh, in choosing the primary school for your children. And you can apply um, this um, you know, this way of thinking uh, to any schools that you are interested um, to register your child in. It need not be Emirati Primary School. So this is just to share our own uh, take on what are the things that parents should consider. Uh, nevertheless, since we are sharing this session, uh, we also want to highlight that um, for those parents who are interested in registering your children uh, to our school, we are going to be having our uh, e-open house next Friday. Uh, and this will be the session that we welcome uh, all parents who are considering registry, registry, registering your children uh, into our school to come for that session. Okay, uh, in, so this uh, e-open house is going to happen um, next Friday. Uh, and on top of that, we have another briefing for um, parent volunteers, uh, meaning for those parents who want to uh, get themselves ahead of the uh, registration phases uh, and uh, you want to do that 
by becoming a parent volunteer to our school. Uh, this will be the session that you will want to come along where we will explain more about our parent volunteer scheme. Um, but do take note, um, this parent volunteer scheme, uh, this briefing is um, for parent volunteers that are starting their work this year uh, in June. So very much if your children are due for registration this year, later on this year in maybe August, uh, you are too late uh, to register for parent volunteer. So this parent volunteer scheme is very much for children who are looking at registering their children in the next year's cycle. Okay, uh, for those who are registering this year, um, it, is, it is too late for that because there's no way we can finish the 40 hours within uh, the next few months. Um, so this parent volunteer scheme and the briefing is very much for parents who are registering your children for next year's P1 registration. Okay. Uh, and we have a sign up uh, form there. So for those uh, parents who are interested, uh, we invite you to go onto that link and sign up uh, for the session. All right, so um, going into the, um, the, the main part of our sharing, uh, really it is about um, why choosing the right primary school matters. Um, we have heard from many parents you know, when we ask them, how do you choose the primary school uh, for your children, um, we hear a lot of them saying that it's about the brand name, you know, which school is popular, which school has a very you know, a big brand name that we keep hearing again and again uh, through the years. Uh, and some might even talk about uh, the PSRA results of the school. So generally, brand name, popularity, results uh, tend to be the um, criteria that parents use um, when choosing the school for their children. Um, but we want to um, perhaps raise this, you know, bring questions to this particular notion. Um, because if we look at MOE, MOE uh, through the years have been um, um, putting out a lot of uh, information uh, in particular about say things like um, every school a good school. These are not just slogans. Um, because for, for, for us in education, we, we know how the primary school operates. We know about the kind of um, policies and control that MOE has over all the schools. I mean, Singapore is one of the uh, few countries in the world uh, whereby we have a very, very uh, uniform and homogeneous uh, kind of system uh, in our whole country, whereby all the primary schools are offering the same the same uh, curriculum. Uh, we have the same yardstick in terms of the PSLE, measuring the outcome of our education. Uh, and because of that centralized uh, control and advice and guidance from MOE, uh, very much all primary school operates more or less the same way. Uh, so very much in terms of the choice uh, of the right school for your children, we ask that parents move away uh, from just considering the na brand name, popularity, or the results, but to consider, in addition, the following factors. Uh, one, distance from home, okay, uh, because um, that has an impact on the time that your child is going to, to be spending on traveling from home to school. And on top of that, there are also other implications, which we will go on in a little bit more details later on. Uh, you will also want to consider the availability of student care center either on-site, on the primary school itself, or uh, in any other privately operated uh, student care centers near the school. You want to consider that. Um, you would also want to understand more about the school culture. While the schools in Singapore are homogeneous in terms of the curriculum, the standard curriculum that we are offering based on MOE's guideline, uh, each school is also different in terms of our school culture, and, and we would like you to kind of check uh, these aspects of school cultures uh, and, and try to relate that with your own family values to see if they actually match. Uh, and also in terms of the school's program, whether they match your child's uh, interests. So these are, this is another point that we will ask the parents to consider. And of course, if you are uh, listening to your friends um, and you have neighbors whose children are 
in the schools that you want to send your child to, it will be good to kind of talk to them uh, to find out more about the teaching and learning of the school. Okay, so it's not just about results per se, because results in some schools, some, you know, maybe even brand name schools, we find that the result is very good, not because the teaching and learning is good, but because um, all the parents in the school send their children for tuitions. So then that actually distorts the whole picture about the quality of teaching and learning in the school. Okay, the last point that we, we also want to bring out, which might not be so important, but for some of you, you might also be considering um, whether to send your, your child to a co-head school or whether you want to send your child to a boys, uh, a pure boys school or a pure girls school. So these are some of the things that we will cover in more details. So first of all, distance from school. So most schools will start uh, at 7.30 in the a.m. or there or thereabout. Okay, I think generally no school will start before that. Uh, so it tends to be around 7.30 to 7.45. Uh, and the ending time uh, might also differ for different schools uh, because different schools would have, uh, we organize their program uh, slightly differently. So you want to find out the start time, um, uh, the, the school start time, and also the end time to, to see if, to check if this actually uh, works well with your school, uh, with your family routine. Okay. Uh, extended traveling time, if you are considering sending your child to a brand name school, but that could be quite far away, then you need to consider that this uh, extended travel time might actually have an impact on your child's uh, rest time, that uh, your child would have to get up earlier, uh, whether you are sending them to school by driving or you are sending them to school um, using school bus system, uh, this would mean extended uh, traveling time. Um, school bus, um, for those who are on school bus, uh, they may have to wake up as early as 6 o'clock, uh, depending on the kind of uh, routes that the school bus uh, will be operating. And especially if you are staying in areas whereby not a lot of um, children are going into the same school, then you might find that the school bus actually has to make a trip just to pick up your child. Uh, then usually that will be lumped up with picking up other children along the way so that they can fill up the school bus uh, in one trip and then send the, the children to the school uh, at one go. Uh, and because of that, uh, your child might have to wake up very early because he or she might be the first one uh, that the school bus would have to pick up. Um, and for school, um, school like ours, um, we, we have lunch time uh, and therefore our school day actually ends slightly later. Uh, at about 2.10 or 2.40. Uh, um, so with that kind of ending time, or even if we don't talk about our school, uh, we talk about other typical school whereby they might not have a lunch time, uh, but they will end their school at about 1.30. Uh, and even with that 1.30 dismissal time, which is actually early enough, um, but then because of the school bus having to plow and send other children back, you might find that by the time the child reach home is about two o'clock or even two thirty. Okay, so if that's the case, then uh, you will find that the meal time of the child will be affected uh, because of that. Um, and these are just the initial factor if we talk about the start time and the end time for curriculum time. Um, but later on, uh, as your child progress into primary three to primary six. Um, they will start participating in CCAs uh, and even uh, extra classes. Um, so these would also mean that the, the hours are stretched even longer. Uh, and in terms of school bus transport, there might be complications because depending on um, how, you know, like some of the school bus, they might say that, okay, I will, I will send the children back uh, once during uh, school dismissal. I might have another one more route uh, later on in the, in the evening but that might not really meet your uh, child's dismissal time because it depends on what your child is participating in. So he or she might just have one extra lesson, um, but then because after that, there's a CCA, so the school, might, school bus might decide that they will only um, round up the children and collect them all at one go uh, at the end of the CCA. So it might mean that your child therefore um, have to wait uh, further before they are being picked up by the school bus if you are relying on that for transportation. So school bus does have its complications uh, if you are thinking about that. So consider carefully 
about uh, about that if you are thinking about um, that as a possible uh, mode of transportation for your children and and how that influence your choice of school because um, there can be quite a lot of uh, inconvenience especially if you are staying further away from the school okay so um, and even if you are sending your children to school um, by driving, I think one of the facts that we, we all know is that many schools have very, very heavy uh, traffic situation in the morning and also during school dismissal. Um, so um, I think earlier in the year, we, we've heard of incidents of, um, of, uh, of a kind of unhappiness uh, between parents uh, against the, the, the school's uh, traffic control and, and it became it became a big issue. So um, the, the frustrations and, and also the time taken is something that is well known. Uh, so do consider that. Um, and, and I think from MOE's point of view, we always strongly advise and support uh, parents in terms of uh, sending your children to a school that is very near to your, to your residence. Okay. Um, and it is important for your child to report to school punctually. And you we want that kind of good habits and good values and mindset right from the start. So do consider that factor uh, very carefully. Um, of course, the next factor is uh, with regards to the availability of student care, uh, whether on-site or near the school. Now, the student care center uh, in each of the primary school does have uh, a situation of um, capacity. So generally, they, most of the time, they will not be able to take in all children who are interested to send uh, to, 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 to make use of that um, kind of care facility within the school. Um, so the prioritization normally will mean that uh, we will actually give higher priority to parents um, uh, in terms of their um, social economic status. Okay, so, so that will be one of, the, one of the factors that the school will take into consideration that we will actually uh, give higher priorities to uh, children who comes from more challenging family background. And for some schools, that would have already filled up most of their uh, student care vacancies. Um, so for most other parents, you most likely would have to explore um, options uh, around the school. So that would be something that you would also uh, need to um, do some research to find out about the, the, the availability of these cares near the school. Um, so student care provides a child with uh, safe and convenient environments to rest, have their meals, or even uh, to do some of their homework uh, after school hours. So these are uh, very important provision for uh, those of us who might not have the, um, the options uh, or family members who can look after our children uh, after they are dismissed from school and before we uh, come home from work. Okay, next aspect that we thought the, student, uh, the, the parents should consider will be about understanding the school culture in relation to your family members, uh, your family values. Uh, so first of all, will be, will be about the focus on academic rigor. Okay, so as we, as we progress, now some schools, some parents might, might, might know of certain schools whereby uh, they have very strong academic rigor. They put very strong emphasis. Um, they might even um, say, for example, uh, some of the uh, SAP school, uh, the special assistance school who are um, perhaps uh, offering uh, Chinese at, uh, at a higher standard. So you will find that your children are required to take Chinese at a higher level from primary one onwards. So you want to ask yourselves whether these are the kind of schools and the kind of rigor really suits your emphasis um, in, in terms of your family uh, background and your, and your value system. So in terms of their emphasis on test scores, because we do have parents sometimes say that, oh, the school is not, you know, is not focused uh, enough on academics uh, because of a certain uh, either emphasis or non-emphasis on test scores. So you will also want to find out more about how, how the school approach and what, what is the school stand with regard to test scores or the number of tests. Um, many of us will probably realize and notice that MOE in recent years have been trying to um, reduce the stress that our children uh, are experiencing from schools. And one of the methods is to uh, cut down on the number of uh, formal examinations uh, that are run in schools. So you, you have heard this uh, from MOE talking about 
removal of mid-year examinations and maybe even removal of year-end examinations in some cases um, as part of that whole overall uh, national emphasis. Um, but beyond that, beyond the removal of, um, of um, the end of year big examinations, um, the schools are still running a different variety of smaller tests uh, and assessments. So you also want to find that whether that combination uh, of uh, tests and assessments um, is really matching your family values in terms of the kind of emphasis that you want to have for your children. You also want to check out in terms of the school's uh, emphasis on character building, which we know that a lot of parents uh, feel very strongly that this is a very important aspect uh, that they want to see uh, in the kind of school that they are sending their children to. Uh, you will also want to find out uh, about unique or special school-based programs um, that are not run in other schools, but might be um, special or unique in the school that you're interested in. So you want to find out more about this and to see if these are the kind of special program that you would like your children to experience. Uh, you want to consider uh, the schools uh, that you, you, know, you, are, you are looking out for, uh, whether they are associated with a certain clan uh, which might suit your family background or even in terms of their religious uh, connection. Uh, special assistant plan school was something that I mentioned just now, uh, whereby these are um, a selected um, number of schools whereby um, they are emphasizing more on the Chinese uh, language acquisition and also the Chinese culture uh, provided by the whole school environment. So you would also want to think through whether these are the kind of schools that you are looking out for. And even down to the school's approach to discipline, okay, um, schools, um, schools' decision on whether a child ought to be king uh, and whether that kind of uh, degree uh, and decision-making is uh, consistent with how you would like your children to be disciplined at home as well. So you want to know all these uh, factors uh, about the school, find out by um, talking to friends with children who are in that school and this uh, will help you in terms of making the decision about whether the school is suitable for your children. You also want to find out in terms of the school programs whether um, they match your child's interest. So um, you want to find out whether the schools provide opportunity for your children to develop their interests beyond the classroom uh, you might also want to shortlist schools with CCAs that are aligned with your child's interest. And all these uh, information these days, um, they are all readily, readily available in MOE and schools websites. So uh, do feel free to go and uh, Google and search uh, these schools and, and, and read more about the materials that they have published in their school websites. That will help you to, um, to uncover this information and will help you in making the decisions. Um, CCAs is important, like in our school, we uh, emphasize the importance of CCAs. So for most schools, uh, many schools, uh, some schools even go to the extent of making CCA rather compulsory for children. Uh, and CCA is an important aspect of our children's development um, for them to acquire new skills and also hone character uh, building qualities like um, being able to work in teams, uh, being able to persevere and their tenacity. Uh, be it individually or in a group setting. So I've mentioned just now that you want to find out more of regards to the quality of teaching and learning of the school beyond just their test scores. Okay, so you want to get some sensing from your friends, parents, with children in the school. Uh, you want to understand uh, the emphasis of the school in relation to the school program uh, beyond the standard teaching and learning. Uh, you might even want to ask to see if you can take a look at some of the materials provided by the school um, to those uh, families um, that you know with children studying in the school. You might want to uh, take a look at those materials provided by the schools. Uh, you will also want to find out more about the school's program in terms of uh, what we call applied learning programs or learning for life programs, um, ICT enabled emphasis and also outdoor learning. So these are some of the various areas that if you go to the different school talks, uh, and I believe later on in the year, uh, more and more schools will be holding their uh, e-open house or even parent engagement sessions to 
to uh, explain to would-be parents about their school programs, you will hear these terms uh, being used by the schools. Okay, so going to the last part about um, co-ed versus non-co-ed schools, I think uh, some of the things that um, our parents will need to consider will be about um, how being in a co-ed school um, do help our children get prepared for the real world in terms of uh, working with both, both genders, being able to uh, mingle and interact. Um, yeah, and so if you have children of different genders, then choosing a co-ed primary school also will save you the hassle of having to go through uh, primary one registration all over again because some, for some of you, it might mean that uh, to have to do parent volunteer work uh, in two sets of schools or even if you are not doing that, you are registering your child uh, through phase 2C, then you will find that if you are registering uh, your, your, your girl into a girl's school, then for your boy later on, you might find that you will have to go through the whole uh, 2C and maybe even balloting again because you do not have that um, option about uh, sending your younger child into the same school with the older siblings uh, through the phase one, uh, phase one kind of uh, priority, which means that uh, we take in the siblings of our existing uh, children. Uh, and that one is... Uh, I would say almost guaranteed that the younger siblings will always be able to get into the same school as the older one. So you will lose that kind of um, option if you, have, if you are choosing to send your child to a, to a single gender school um, and when you actually have children of different gender. All right. So the, so the next part, so just now we have just covered about the factors that um, parents should be considering in terms of selecting uh, the right primary school for your child and for your family. Uh, next, we are going to briefly go through the different phases of the primary one registrations um, because it, it is quite, um, quite a complex system. And for many of us who are not familiar with this, uh, especially if you are the first time, you might find this quite confusing. Uh, and even after this uh, briefing, you might still not be very clear and you might still have to you know, read through the material, be it for the slides that we have provided you, um, or even uh, to go to MOE website to, to read out more about this if, you, if there are specific concerns of yours uh, with regards to um, which phase do you qualify uh, for the school that you are interested to send your child to. Um, so as I've said just now, phase one uh, is the first phase, and, we, and this is the phase that we will take in existing children's uh, siblings. Okay, so that is phase one. And as I've said also earlier, that in phase one, we generally are able to take in all the siblings. So, so far, we do not have schools whereby at phase one, they are not able to take in all the siblings. So, all primary school at this point in time, we are able to take in all the siblings uh, of children who are already studying in the school. Okay, but if these siblings, the older siblings, have already graduated from the primary school, Okay, right now in set one, but he was previously studying in that primary school and your next child coming in, actually the age gap is more than six years, such that when, the, when, when it's time for your younger child to come into the school, your older child already graduated, then you actually will not qualify for phase one. You will qualify for phase two, two A. Okay, and in this case here, we just want to say that this is new because in the past, uh, we used to have phase two A one, and 2A2. And the main difference between the, phase, the phases 2A1 and 2A2 is that phase 2A1 give further priority um, to parents uh, or siblings who are official member of a registered uh, student alumni association of the school. So, so in the past, we used to give that an additional priority. Um, to encourage parents um, to sign up as official members of the alumni association. Uh, but since last year, when MOE announced uh, the new changes in the primary one registration system, uh, we have combined the 2A1 and 2A2 to form the new phase 2A. So in this new phase 2A, there is no longer a differentiation between um, just a formal student and official uh, 
member of the alumni association. There's no longer a distinction between the two of them. Okay, so phase 2A, as I've said, um, just now includes um, both uh, children of parents who was a student of that school, and it also includes the case whereby the older child already graduated and the younger child is coming in. Okay, so that kind of situation would also qualify for phase 2A. Okay, on top of that, you know, these are the two most common uh, situations for phase 2A, um, but phase 2A also includes parents uh, who is a member of the school's advisory or management committee. Uh, it also includes parents who are a staff member of the school. And also phase 2A would also include the students from the MOE kindergartens that are residing within this primary school. Okay, um, so, so you will also want to check out. So because of this, you will also want to check out whether the school that you are interested to send your children in uh, has an MOE kindergarten. Okay, because if that's the case and your child is not already in that kindergarten, then it might mean steeper, steeper uh, competition for the later, later phases. But if you already have a child who is, who is registered and studying in an MOE kindergarten, then you actually qualify to register into that school under phase 2A, right? Next, after phase 2A, we go into what we call phase 2B. And phase 2B um, actually uh, includes uh, parents and children with the following uh, background. So it includes parents who have joined the primary school as a parent volunteer, like what I've mentioned earlier. Um, but the parent volunteer, as I said just now, has to start their volunteer work one year in advance so that they are able to complete the required number of hours uh, a year later by the time um, the child is due for registration. Uh, it also includes um, the parents who is a member uh, of the end, uh, who is endorsed by the church or clan that are directly connected with the primary school. Okay, so for those parents, you also qualify uh, in the phase 2B registration uh, for that school. So one of the very uh, kind of common example will be, um, many of us might know that Singapore Hokkien Hui Kwan uh, has several schools uh, that is uh, owned by them. Uh, and therefore uh, for members, uh, for, 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 for parents who are members of the Singapore Hokkien Hui Kwan, you would actually be able to um, go through the process to Hui Kwan recommendation uh, to get into a uh, selected primary school, uh, be it your choice or, you know, the Hui Kwan will also have certain certain uh, procedure in terms of how they decide uh, in terms of their recommendation of parents to those primary schools that are connected with them. Um, for those parents who are also active um, volunteers in the RCs, um, you would also qualify for phase 2B uh, and that with this, you will want to check with your RCs uh, with regards to um, the processes and the procedures uh, in terms of that endorsement. Now, after phase 2B, the next phase will be phase 2C uh, will be for any uh, children who have not uh, registered in phase 2B or 2A or even phase 1. So it's for all Singaporean and uh, Singapore PRs uh, that have no uh, link whatsoever uh, with, the, with the school. And, and therefore, usually the phase 2C uh, will tend to be the one um, whereby for the popular school, uh, there will be balloting uh, and that the distance from the school uh, will therefore matter a lot in terms of whether you are likely to be successful in your registration into this primary school. So phase 2C is the one that is uh, highly dependent on the distance away from the school. Um, yeah, and, and it's for all parents who have no uh, other connections with the, with the school. Okay, so because phase 2C is such, uh, uh, is, uh, is a key um, phase where there are a lot of competition happening in many schools. And I think yearly, you will have read that from the uh, newspaper report as well. 
in terms of the um, degree of competition in some of these popular schools. So because of that, when there is a balloting, there will be parents who are not successful. Then when uh, these unsuccessful parents would then move on to what we call the phase 2C supplementary, whereby after the phase 2C, for those schools who have still yet to fill up their number of places, uh, they will open up their vacancies at this phase, phase 2C supplementary. And we want to advise parents that at this phase, you want to be very careful uh, in terms of considering where you want to register your child. Uh, because if you want to register your child into another school whereby there is a high likelihood of uh, balloting at 2C supplementary, uh, then you are taking a very high risk. Because if your child is not successful in the balloting in phase 2C, and then not successful again in the phase 2C supplementary, then what will happen next is that you're, you will then drop into phase three, whereby you will be considered uh, posting together with the rest of the international students. And again, you will be uh, sent to schools whereby uh, they still have not filled up their places after 2C supplementary. Okay, so that's very much a, a very brief uh, snapshot of what the different phases are all about. Um, so I want to demonstrate um, the whole phase uh, considering of consideration of the different phases by uh, using an example uh, of our school. Um, so our school uh, so far, uh, the number of intake for um, primary one this year has not been confirmed yet, uh, but so far uh, MOE has uh, been giving us uh, 210 uh, as the vacancy that we are allowed to fill up. Uh, and we hope that this will continue to be the case this year. Uh, but um, I just want to say here that this number is still not confirmed yet. So this is just an example. Um, we are, so all the numbers here are hypothetical, um, except some of the key um, numbers that I would, I would uh, highlight here. So say MOE give us 210 students to take in at primary one. Um, and just as a hypothetical number, uh, we might have 112 siblings uh, that are interested to be registered and they registered in their phase one. So, so that will mean that out of 210, already 112 places are being taken up. So we are left with maybe about, uh, say, 98 places. Okay, then next, what will happen next is that um, we are supposed to allocate from the remaining places uh, 20 into phase 2B and 40 into phase 2C. So in the minimum, all primary school would have 20 places in phase 2B and every school would also have 40 places at phase 2C. So for phase 2B, we are then able to take in the parent volunteers and other uh, community uh, volunteers uh, or clan members who are, who are qualified. And phase 2C will be about all other parents with no connection, but are just living around the school. So we definitely have guaranteed 20 places for 2B and 40 places for 2C, okay? And this is new because in the past, it used to be that the number of places between phase 2B and phase 2C are equally divided, okay? Uh, meaning it's 20 and 20. But last year, during the announcement of the policy change, uh, MOE have decided to put more emphasis on phase 2B, wanting to um, give more chance for success uh, for parents to be able to send your children to a school that is near your residence. So that's why they have included the compulsory places set aside for phase 2C to 40. Okay, so after, after allocating the number of places 20 to phase 2B and 40 to phase 2C, okay, we will notice that the remaining places that is now available for phase 2A is actually 38. Okay, as an example, 38. So right now, assuming that at phase 2A, because it's about parents uh, who are ex-students uh, from the school or even older siblings who have graduated, um, for some schools, especially for young schools, uh, the number of take-up 
uh, might not be high. So as an example, if we say that, let's assume that six places were taken up at phase 2A, therefore we are left, okay, sorry, I think uh, I have a mistake here. It should be five vacancies taken up. Then uh, it will make sense for my remaining places uh, left to be 33, okay? So, um, so after six, uh, five places being taken up at phase 2A, I'm left with 33 places. Then again, if you look at the number of allocation for phase 2B and 2C that we have mentioned just now, you will see that there is a stronger emphasis on phase 2C, meaning we, we give double the places to phase 2C as compared to phase 2B. So that's why you see it was a 40 and 20 just now. Okay, right now with the remaining places, 33 as a hypothetical number, we again divide it into, into the proportion uh, same way as the, the situation just now, whereby two parts will go to phase 2C and then one part will go to phase 2B. So in this case here, if the number of places left after phase 2A is 33, okay, we will divide it into three parts. So 11 per part, 22, two parts of it will go to phase 2C, 11 will go to phase 2B. And we add that into the 20 and 40 that was already allocated to the phase 2B and 2C respectively, that that forms the number of places available for these two phases. Okay, and, and, and then we will go through the phase 2B and whatever places that are not taken up at phase 2B will drop to phase 2C. So your phase 2C might see an increase uh, in number after phase 2B. Uh, and after that, then the phase 2C will be the available places um, for parents um, to, to register their children. And again, if the number of parents registered, registering exceeds the number of places available, then there will be a balloting situation. So we'll go through that all the way until all the places are being filled. But this year, we just want to emphasize that the new change is that there is double the number of places allocated at phase 2C as compared to phase 2B. This slide shows the date. These are confirmed dates for the primary one registration for this year. Okay, um, the information is available in MOE website. And also, again, we are sharing this slide later, so you can uh, make reference to these late dates uh, later on. So phase 2B, we, uh, we just want to um, be, uh, you know, go through a little bit about, more about this phase 2B, particularly uh, the um, volunteer system. Um, so as I've highlighted earlier, um, the phases, from phase one all the way until phase two C um, are meant for Singapore citizens and Singapore permanent residents. Uh, if you are not a resident, if you are not a permanent resident, you are not a Singapore citizen, you only qualify for phase three, which is after all the earlier phases have been completed. And that, uh, and for international students, your posting uh, will be decided. You have to register uh, centrally with MOE, and then MOE will, uh, will go in, move into phase three after all the primary school registration uh, earlier phases are completed. Then uh, they will announce you to you uh, the outcome of your registration. So for phase 2B, the parent volunteer, as we have said, usually would have to start their volunteer work uh, in the 1st of July, the year before. So for qualification for this year, that means the parent volunteer, you would have re required to work in these schools as a parent volunteer from 1st of July last year. Okay, and you need to have completed at least 40 hours. And for some schools, they might even increase the number of hours. Um, for some of those popular schools, they might actually increase the number of hours uh, beyond the 40 hours. Uh, and that is uh, allowed. Uh, and you need to complete these 40 hours uh, within a year. So by the next year's um, 30th of June, you should complete your 40 hours of service. And then after June, at July, we would commence our P1 registration. And that will, be, that will mean that for those parents who have completed their 40 hours in a month or two times, um, your, 
the children would then qualify to register uh, under phase 2B. Okay, parents being a church or clan member uh, connected to the school, we have mentioned it just now, parents um, who are endorsed as an active community leader like uh, RC members, uh, these are things that we have already mentioned. Uh, and we just want to highlight an uh, additional point whereby the completion of the 40 hours of service does not guarantee a place for your child. Because as we have said, uh, there could be a situation whereby at phase 2B, um, there is a balloting situation. So despite your completion of 40 hours of service, um, there is, it is also not a guarantee that you will be successful in phase 2B. Okay, so that's something that parents will want to take note uh, in terms of um, allocating your own time for that voluntary service in the school. Okay, so that's basically the explanation in terms of the different phases of P1 registration. Um, next, we want to go on to the, to the next part of our presentation, which is talking about, okay, after successfully registering your child into a primary school, then what should you do before your child um, is due to report to the school for, on their first day, what, what are the things that you can do uh, at home to help preparing your child um, for the primary school uh, life? So first of all, we want to encourage that you can uh, actually uh, get your child to understand more about the new environment. Uh, in the preschool, of course, there will be, um, the, the preschool will try to arrange for immersion program, uh, particularly uh, on years whereby uh, there is no um, SMM measures uh, and that the, the primary schools are able to host your child fiscally. So those have been very helpful. Uh, but in recent you know, last two, three years, uh, we have not been able to do that. So this year we have to see um, how the SMM measure is being, um, being relaxed, hopefully later on in the year and um, the schools might be able to do uh, this immersion program again. But if not, you might want to take your child to the school's e-orientation, particularly if um, they have uh, recorded their session. You might want to view the, these videos with your children and to see, uh, you know, get themselves familiarized uh, with the school uniform, um, the kind of facilities that the school might have. Uh, you will want to show your child pictures of the schools. You will want to go to the school website together with your child and maybe to read out more, find out more about the school. Uh, you will want to also allow your child to talk to other children, um, you know, your neighbours or even their playmates um, who might be studying in the, the school that you are interested in to find out more about the school. Um, you would also want to, you know, especially when you have gotten hold of the student handbook, um, you will also want to go through the rules with your children at home so that they also understand about the expectation of the schools about the do's and don'ts uh, with regards to school uniform, um, the, the haircut, um, and so on and so forth. Um, you will also want to assure your children that going into the primary school is a new environment. Um, the school will usually be very much bigger as compared to the preschool, um, but to assure them that um, they will always be able to get help from the teachers and they should always um, bring up their issues with the, with the teachers should they encounter any. Okay, you also want to encourage your child to make new friends because not all their playmates from the preschool will be joining them in the same schools. So you will want to encourage them to make new friends, to understand that um, they, would have, they would have classmates from a different background, um, living maybe not around the same neighborhood, and um, we want them to uh, appreciate the kind of diversity and accept differences that they might come across. Um, you want them to um, start getting used to the new routine and timetable. One of the things that um, our children will need some time to get used to will be the longer hour of um, primary school, particularly for those who are only attending a uh, half day for preschool. Uh, so you will find that, they, they might find that, you know, especially in the, in the, in the start of the year, um, that the longer hours in primary school might be a little bit uh, tiring for them. So you want to get them mentally prepared for the longer schooling hours. You want, you want to talk to them about um, the kind of habits that they should cultivate about getting ready for school, um, 
making sure that they go through their school bags daily and match uh, what they need to bring on the next day uh, and pack their bags accordingly. Because if, you, if they were to bring everything to school every day, then their school bags are going to be very heavy. Uh, you want to talk about, about how they should be interacting and playing with their friends in school. Um, and you also want to set up, perhaps set up a routine for homework and even having that conversations uh, to talk to your children about what they are learning in schools. Um, so show your child how to pack their bags for the day and then help the child to adapt to the daily routine. Okay, so um, that's very much um, all that we, we have um, to share with you. So next we will um, open up um, the session for uh, Q and A. Yeah. Okay, let me go back to the page uh, with the dates for the P1 registration. So some of you have asked to uh, come back to this page. Yeah. Um, if you would like to, you are you can either continue keying in your questions into the chat or you might want to unmute yourself uh, to raise your questions. So again, while waiting for questions, we just want to emphasize that the points that we have gone through above is very much generic. Uh, and we hope that uh, parents, you are, you know, in, in this period of time whereby you are looking out for, you know, shortlisting the schools that you might be interested. Um, go to several schools. Um, don't just stick to one school. I think um, open up our choices, particularly if we, we, we say that we might not um, understand all the schools that well, because I think for many of us, it's like until our children are due to, to go to a primary school, we might not pay so much attention about um, the, the schools, uh, even around our residence, uh, and even finding out more about the kind of program in that school. So this is uh, really the time if your child is due for registration uh, this year or even next year. Uh, for those who are registering next year, then this is really the time that you will want to consider uh, looking out for schools that you might be interested to sign up as parent volunteers. Um, but for those who are, your, your child is already uh, due for registration uh, this year, then you want to find out uh, more about the kind of um, a balloting situation or even uh, in terms of the uh, programs in the school to help you make that decision about your shortlisting. Yeah, because some of these uh, decisions that you make right, can change, um, can be very fluid and change on the spot because you might be interested in one school, but you know, as you as you look at the days that go on, right, you find that a increasingly, you know, at particularly at phase two C, because you might say that okay, at, at first I think that oh they have sixty places I want to try, okay, but then as the day go by, you might find that oh more and more parents are registering, and then before the end of the registration, you find that the number registered in the school might have already ballooned to eighty or even one hundred. They are vying for the sixty places. So then you might want to decide, especially if you are living outside the one kilometer radius, whether you actually have a chance. And usually the school would also um, call you up and then, and then informing you, particularly if you are living outside the well, one kilometers uh, radius to, to, to see if you would want to consider withdrawing. Because if you are living outside one kilometers and the balloting is already within the one kilometers, you don't even have a chance to ballot. So there's no point in wasting the opportunity because it's better for you to register in another school. Another school. Um, so you will want to have a whole listing of schools whereby you will prioritize in your registration and you, you will want to have the listing such that if, the, if your top choice school, you know, the situation is not going in your favor, you will want to be able to very quickly uh, withdraw your child from that school in terms of that registration and register your child in the next school on your list. Yeah, so you want to have that kind of uh, things ready. Okay, yep, I have some questions. So, um, okay, some parents are asking for clarifications about the chances for those within the one kilometers uh, versus those who are between one kilometers and two 
uh, kilometers in, in relation to Singapore citizen and uh, Singapore permanent resident. Um, so again, uh, I will answer the last part first. Um, the primary one registration system give absolute priority to Singapore citizens. Okay, so Singapore citizens will be taken in first in all phases. Okay, so once there's a balloting situation, if the balloting situation is already happening to the Singapore citizens, then the PR would have no choice. We have no chance at all. And the system will actually take in all Singapore citizens first. So meaning if there are places available and that the balloting for Singapore citizen is at maybe outside two kilometers. So meaning a Singapore citizen, so the balloting happened at outside two kilometer radius for Singapore citizens. So that means the Singapore citizens who are living outside two kilometers is getting a chance to ballot. Okay, but for a PR who is living closer than that, you might be within one kilometer. But because of the system's absolute priority to the Singapore citizen, so the Singapore citizens who are living further away actually has a higher priority than the Singapore permanent residents. So that's what we mean by absolute priority to take in Singapore citizens first. So if a school is announcing that they are balloting, be it within one kilometer, between one to two kilometers, or outside two kilometers, for Singapore citizens, it means that all the PR, you have no chance at all already for that phase. Okay, so that's one thing that we want to say. Um, now, in terms of living 1K versus those between 1K and 2K, definitely those who are uh, within 1K would have a higher chance as compared to those living within 1K to 2K. So if the balloting is already in within 1K, okay, for Singapore citizens, huh? let's just assume for Singapore citizens, balloting within 1K, it means that for Singapore citizens living within 1 to 2K, which is outside the 1K radius, you have no chance at all. But if the balloting, the announced balloting is for between 1K to 2K for Singapore citizens, then what that means is that for those who are living within 1K, you have already succeeded in registering your child into that school. So, 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 so that's, that's, the, that's what I mean by when you are living within 1K and compared to 1 to 2K, you have, again, also absolute advantage over 1 to 2K. So if the balloting is happening between 1 to 2K and you are living within 1K, that means you are already successful. Okay, so I hope that clarifies. All right, uh, some more questions. Okay, so uh, we'll click in on some more questions. Okay, so phase 2B, if you are talking about um, the relative chance um, of an RC member uh, versus a parent volunteer, uh, then um, again, they are all lumped together. So um, I think when we talk about phase 2B, uh, if I go back to the slide just now, actually includes parent volunteers, uh, RC members, and also parents who are related by church or clan connections. Okay, so all of these parents are uh, considered the same. Okay, so nobody, so it's not that, oh, parent volunteer will have a higher priority over uh, the RC member. No, or, or, or the other way around, or that the clan uh, members will have a higher priority. No, so all that qualifies would all be considered the same. The only difference is, again, distance from school. Should there be a balloting situation for phase 2B? Okay, we don't differentiate between parent volunteer or RC members or clan or church members, but we differentiate by the distance. So again, those that live within the one kilometers will be taken in first. If there's already a balloting situation, then all those who are outside are not considered. 
So just now the example that I have given, right, is about balloting for Singapore citizens. Okay, and when, when and I say that when the balloting is happening for Singapore citizens, it means that PR, you are totally out already. But if we say that the balloting is for PR, then it means that all the Singapore citizens, whichever distance that you are in, you are already successful already. Okay, so now coming back to phase 2B again, all the parents, no matter your parent volunteer or clan members, all are the same. Okay, the balloting, you will want to listen carefully about the balloting at which distance. If the balloting is 1K, okay, anything outside 1K, you have no chance. If the balloting is between 1 to 2K, then anyone who is living closer, you are already automatically in. Same thing if we say that the balloting is outside 2K. It means that anybody who is living within 2Ks, you are successful already. Okay. All right. I hope that clarifies. So we have one more question coming in. Come. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Show the slide again to how many? Uh, the hypothetical examples. Huh? Um, okay, we, we are not differentiating that. So the, the, the number, okay, so total how many PV or RC and church volunteers? Um, that would depends on school to school. Compulsory 30? No. Yeah, the compulsory places set aside is 20. Yeah, but how many PV and RC or church volunteers that, that will register that one will vary from school to school. Uh, and all of them are considered equally uh, derived from the, for that 20 places. The only thing that matters that differentiate between all these different parents is the distance from school. Okay. Okay, so with regards to us, so again, uh, I want to say that this one here, uh, this is not a session for us to, uh, to, to promote our school, but for those who want to be, uh, who are interested in our school and you ask about the balloting situation for phase 2B and phase 2C, okay, I think last year for both our parent volunteer and for phase 2C, uh, we are balloting within one kilometers for um, Singapore citizens. Okay. So that's for last year's situation. And um, for phase 2C, the, the, the balloting for phase, uh, the balloting for within 1K at phase 2C for Singapore citizens, it has been like that um, for the last um, five, six years already. Yeah, so we are uh, anticipating that it will remain the same. So for phase 2C, that's, that's how keen the competition is. Um, for phase 2B, last year was the first time that we are having a balloting situation and already we are balloting uh, within 1K. So meaning there were actually uh, some of our parent volunteers uh, who were not successful in the phase 2B uh, balloting. Okay. But because of their, of their service to us, so we have also assured them that we are putting them uh, high up in our priority in terms of those who have signed up on our wait list uh, and that and we have uh, vacancies becoming available, then uh, these parent volunteers who have contributed their hours with us, uh, we are uh, giving that priority to them in terms of taking in their children. But again, when that places will come out, uh, again, we do not know because we will only have places becoming available if there are students who withdraw uh, from our school. Okay. Kim. So um, right now, no more questions. Huh? Okay, so um, if there is uh, no more questions, uh, then we will end the session for today. For those of us uh, who still have questions after this session, um, you can go to our school websites and then you can uh, send in your questions to our school's uh, generic email. Uh, we do check that generic email regularly. And if you have a questions, uh, we will do our best to uh, answer you. But for those, uh, those parents who are interested to register your child and, and you are considering Emirati Primary School, uh, we strongly invite you to come for our session uh, next week uh, on Friday, where we will, uh, we will actually share more uh, with regards um, to our school program. Okay.
Um, so, okay, I'll go back to that slide about the registration yep, and our session for next Friday. Okay, so um, if nothing else, um, thank you very much, parents, for taking time to attend our session. Yeah, thank you and have a nice weekend. Thank you very much. We look forward to see many of you uh, for our next week's uh, session. Thank you. We end the session.